Hi, I'm Eloise Hirsch. I'm on the board of the Fresh Kills Park Alliance, and I'm also the park administrator. Fresh Kills Park is becoming such a terrific resource with its great landscape, with all the programs that we offer. But I think my favorite thing about the place is what it represents. It really tells us, reminds us about the strength and resilience of nature. It shows us the potential of restoration and transformation. The Fresh Kills Park Alliance sponsors all of the programs that you see here. We are so glad to welcome you to Discovery Day. And if you would like to support programs like this and many more, I hope you'll click on the link that you see at the end of this video. Thanks, and I hope we see you soon. Welcome to Fresh Kills Park. We're taking a walk up North Mound, and we'll learn about what's involved with turning what was once the world's largest landfill into a New York City park. As you look at this beautiful hillside, you would never guess that underneath those waving grasses is a sophisticated mix of soils and clay and gravel and plastic liner and miles and miles of pipes, pumps, vents, and wells that manage all the products that this and all landfills make from decomposing waste, landfill gas and leachate. And you can see as we start up the hill, ahead is a flare station that's used to flare the gas when the gas processing system is shut for maintenance. And you can hear the blowers that pull gases through the wells and pipes to the on-site landfill gas plant that's maintained by the Department of Sanitation. And on the left, you can see one of the wellheads that's connected to that flare station. The purified gas is sold by the city to National Grid and is connected to National Grid's pipeline and distributed for cooking and heating to homes in Staten Island. It's an alternative energy generation site. As with all landfills, the amount of gas being produced is decreasing over time, and eventually, with oversight from DEC, the system will be decommissioned. The Fresh Kills Park site is huge, 2,200 acres, almost three times the size of Central Park. The landscape is a surprising mixture of natural features that look like a state park or even someplace out west. And at the same time, it's a highly engineered, man-made landscape. It's part of the wonder of this place. Before it was a landfill, the Fresh Kills site was primarily tidal creeks and coastal marshes. In 1948, when the city needed to be thinking about where it was going to dispose of its trash, the park planner Robert Moses established Fresh Kills as a landfill, telling the people of Staten Island that it would be back, that it would be filled for two to three years, and then the city would come back and build residential and commercial and park spaces on the filled land. But three years turned into five, into 10, and 20, and finally, 50 years. And eventually, as all other landfills around the city were closed in the 80s because of stricter federal regulations, and the city made the investment of fresh kills to meet the highest environmental standards, eventually, all of New York City's waste came here, over 150 million tons. There were decades of protests until finally, in 1996, politics coalesced to make the city and state agree to close the landfill by, leaving a, by 2001, leaving a five-year interval to plan for how the city would develop another way to get rid of its garbage. I'm going to stop here because I want to tell you, I want you to look at those those waterways and marshes. When people say, what did it look like before it was a landfill? That is what it looked like. So once it was decided to close the landfill, the city, partnering with the state and the Municipal Art Society, knowing that it would never get this much vacant land again, 
undertook a project to figure out what was the best way to make the site into the public asset that it could be. There was an international competition that attracted landscape architects from around the world, and the winning firm, James Corner Field Operations, began a three-year community process, as well as undertaking ecological and other studies, that would yield an illustrative park plan known as the Draft Master Plan. You can look at, look at it through a link on our website. That plan organized the 2,200 acres of open grassland and streams and the engineered structures into one cohesive park that focused on the waterfront at the center of the site. Once the plan was completed in 2006, responsibility for developing the site was given to the Parks Department with the understanding that parks and sanitation would work together to achieve what everyone agreed was the ultimate best use of the site, an extraordinary public park. Let me talk about these trees for a minute. They're interesting. They were not planted by humans. They were planted by birds, feeding and then dropping their seeds, which took root in wet places along the paths. Those wet places are, are, are uh, rocky ditches. They're called swales that are part of the water management system um, for the site. In its naturalized state, all the trees you see around the site have come from natural causes. Grasses were planted by sanitation on top of all the layers of cover, but everything else is the work of nature. There are three projects that have already been built. The Alahalo soccer fields on the southern edge of the park, Schmuel Park and Playground in the Travis neighborhood, and the 3.2 mile New Springville Greenway that runs along the eastern edge of the park along Richmond Avenue. The first projects were done at the edge of the park so that communities that had been, been felt that communities, neighboring communities that had had the most impact from the landfill could see that in fact change was on the, on the way. Right now, North Park Phase 1, slated to open in 2021, is in construction. South Park, in design now, is planned for 2024. And the amazing over 500 acre East Park with its rolling grasslands is in planning. You can find out more about these projects on our website. That's West Park in the distance. You can see the capping and closing that's going on there. These developments are all possible because of the extraordinary engineering that has gone into managing the landfill, which then combines with the surging, restoring ecological processes that have established various habitats with return of wildlife, particularly grasslands, which are now the largest grassland habitat in the region. They're hosting rare birds and other species. There are, other, there are opportunities here to study how we can learn to manage our reclaimed landscapes. And our team works with universities on restoration ecology. And our education program incorporates what we learn about natural systems. Countries from around the world and cities from around our country have come to find out how they too can transform their landfills into assets for the public. And all that we learn about natural systems just gives the background to what you see when you get to the top of North Mound. And you see the ongoing transformation of your next great park.
These hills and waterways and the developments to come are the future park. Thanks for coming along on this walk up North Mound. I hope you'll check out some of the other videos on Discovery Week that will show you more about the wildlife, the landscape, the art, and the fun of this park that is becoming.